In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, grant us concentration that we may learn, listen, understand, have a peaceful mind, and remember that you're with us always. Amen. In this video, we're going to continue the discussion of ecosystem ecology and continue to our discussion of nutrient cycles. In the last video, we looked briefly at the water cycle and how that is being used. Again, didn't highlight this necessarily, but with deforestation, we're also disrupting the water cycle. Transpiration is changing, which may change the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. And then we looked in a lot more detail at the nitrogen cycle. In this video, we want to start by talking about the carbon cycle. Okay? And the carbon cycle, very similar to what we've seen with the nitrogen cycle, is going to be involving this interaction between the biotic and abiotic systems in the planet. We're going to also see, unlike the nitrogen cycle, when we didn't see a large storage area, we're going to see an importance of sort of the storage of carbon in the atmosphere, or I should say, in the ecosystem. And so just like the nitrogen cycle, we're going to start in the atmosphere, okay? Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Now, unlike nitrogen, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is a very small proportion of the atmospheric gases. And so that's an important consideration, and minor changes in that can have major effects. So carbon in the form of carbon dioxide through photosynthesis, either looking at the plants on the land or looking at photosynthesis by the algae and the other materials in the waters, is the form in which we take the carbon dioxide from an inorganic form and make it into an organic form. Sugars are made through the process of photosynthesis. So we're taking this carbon that was in the form of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and we're going to make it available now for organisms in the higher trophic levels. So in the food chains, as mentioned before with the nitrogen cycle, okay, the Animals, first the herbivores would eat the, the plants and then bring that carbon into their system. And then the animals, the, uh, the carnivores could then consume the herbivores to bring the carbon dioxide into them. Okay, whether it's a raccoon or some other animal, all of these will go through respiration, which will return the carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Same as plants. The plants also will respire and bring some of that into the atmosphere. So that's sort of a mini cycle there. Carbon dioxide is collected by the plants, either respired directly out by the plants or consumed by the animals and then respired out by the animals. Okay. The same thing is sort of happening in the water sources too in that we see respiration occurring and we have respiration in the by the fish and the other organisms there that will allow for that to occur. Okay, so we've done that little cycle here. Now, the carbon cycle is a little bit different because we have a couple of sources of carbon that are stored. The first one is the dissolved form. So a lot of the carbon that's available is going to be dissolved in the ocean. Again, a large, large proportion of the earth is covered by water, so it'll dissolve as bicarbonate, HCO3 minus, and that will act as both a buffer and will act as a source in the nitrogen or of source of the carbon that can be released. So there's some that's already being dissolved in there and sort of stored there. 
the other source of carbon, or maybe I should put it this way, the other buffer or storage of carbon is going to be found in the fossil fuels. And so the fossil fuels here are going to be a major source of carbon that's sort of trapped out of the atmosphere. And so this source of carbon, animals and plants that lived long ago that have now decayed and are stored inside the earth, sort of traps that and prevents increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Well, what do we know? Well, we like to drive cars. We like to stay warm in the winter. So a lot of these fossil fuels are being removed and being used by humans that are consuming them and releasing them back into the atmosphere. And so over the past 100 years or so, or probably 200 years now, there's been a dramatic increase in the amount of carbon. Again, we're creating an imbalance. This carbon that was stored in the ground in the form of these fossil fuels is now being released into the atmosphere. Some of that is increasing. Photosynthesis is increasing. However, we're also removing forests. Deforestation, using that lumber, is another way in which we are adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Well, what does this affect? And I think many of you or most of you probably are already aware of the connection between carbon dioxide and methane, which we're not going to talk about. Methane is a reduced form of carbon that's produced by some microorganisms that will capture carbon dioxide and release methane. Both of these are known as greenhouse gases. And why are they known as greenhouse gases? Well, as I said when we talked about energy flow, out of the sunlight that comes down and hits the earth, only about 1% is actually captured by the plants. Most of that sunlight energy simply reflects off the earth and is returned to the space. Okay? However, some of it is going to be trapped in the atmosphere. So these greenhouse gases are going to deflect the heat back towards the surface of the Earth. And that's a good thing in normal amounts of carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases because that's what maintains the temperature on Earth. And so it allows Earth to have a certain amount of temperature or a certain temperature that can sustain life. However, the issue comes when we increase the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, more of that energy is retained on the surface of the Earth, and that can lead to increased temperatures on Earth, which has been linked to changes in ecosystems, changes in the ranges of populations, changes in the ability of species to maintain where they are for a long time. So as we continue to increase the amount of energy that's being trapped in the atmosphere, the temperature goes up, we begin to see some changes. Well, what are some examples of these changes? Well, the first one I'm going to talk about is the coral bleaching. So corals are a very interesting. They're ocean uh, organisms that live in the ocean. They have this relationship that they have developed. Okay, So it's a symbiotic relationship between the corals themselves, which form the structures that we see in the ocean, and a photosynthetic protozoan. Okay, And this protozoan that lives in there, that's what gives the, uh, the coral its particular color. And as the sun shines down on there, they collect the sunlight, they provide energy for the corals, and the corals, which grow very slowly, will allow that to occur. Okay? And so what happens is, as the temperature increases, you have a tendency for the photosynthetic organisms to leave. And so you end up with a light colored or a lighter, less coloration in the coral itself. That's the bleaching aspect. 
And so what happens is, is normally this cycle occurs if the ocean increases in the summer and then decreases again in the winter, it's a reversible change in that the photosynthetic organism will come back. However, what we're seeing now is rather than coming back, the bleaching is actually becoming permanent in that the coral is not, or the protozoans are not coming back to the coral and so therefore the coral begins to die and we see the breakdown of these structures that took hundreds of years to grow and they begin to die. So increasing the temperature of the ocean, another effect that we're seeing is as we have more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is an acidification of the ocean. There's more carbon dioxide dissolved in the water which means we're reducing the pH of the water, and this is also affecting the growth of the coral. So that gives you one example of how changing in the conditions can change the growth of the organisms. Okay. As I say here, the realized niche of the corals are being reduced. So they have certain conditions they can grow in. As we re increase the temperature, the areas available for that coral to grow in are reduced. So the fundamental niche is no longer being able to be maintained. Another example of this are tropical disease expansion. So as we increase temperature, we see tropical diseases such as malaria that are beginning to expand to new parts of the world. And I like this example because we can reach closer to home on this. So if we look back in the 1980s, malaria was only found in parts of Southern California, or the should rephrase that and say the malaria mosquito, the mosquito that carries the malaria parasite, was only found in Southern California and extreme Southern parts of the United States. As we've seen this change in temperature, again, related to the change in the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we're beginning to see expansion of the mosquito. The mosquito is no longer killed in colder areas in the winter, and therefore it's going to lead to changes in its population range. And so the malaria has now been in most or many of the southern states and even a few of the southern parts of some of the northern states. So climate change, potential disruption, if you will, of the carbon cycle has had some major impacts on the ranges of these particular organisms. We're also seeing changes in the general ecosystem. So one of the last things I want to do in this video is talk a little bit about biomes. Okay. Now, I hope and I suspect that most of you in one way or another have come across biomes and this is just reinforcing previous knowledge. Okay. So what is a biome? A biome is a major type of ecosystem on land, um, we also would consider the oceans themselves an independent biome. <coughs> and so in some ways we can consider that. But we're focusing on the land or terrestrial biomes for this particular one. How are they characterized? Well, one of the things that you should note is that it, they cover large areas. These are not local climates. These are not areas that are affected by that. We will talk a little bit about that in a little bit. But biomes cover large areas. They have a characteristic appearance. They are going to be set by climatic conditions. And here we're talking about two in particular conditions, and that's temperature and moisture that will determine what types of organisms can live in that area, what type of plants and animals. When we talk about these, we mostly refer to it as vegetation. So it would be plants, but the plants are supporting the animals, so we could connect that too. 
And so this is going to be how we determine the name. And I give you a list of eight tropical rainforest, temperate evergreen forest, temperate deciduous forest, which is the area we live in or are in in western Pennsylvania here, temperate grasslands, desert, very dry, not necessarily hot, but there are a lot of hot deserts too, savanna, taiga, and tundra. And so it's a relationship between these two. And this map is giving you a, distri a distribution of the biomes across the earth. And so when we talk about this, you can notice certain characteristics, certain locations. So I always like to point out the Taiga that runs all the way up through the northern part of the climate here. We can come down here at the equator and you see trop or tropical rainforests that run through that area coming down through there. At 30 degrees latitudes, about in this range, you see a lot of desert areas. Okay. Now, presence of mountains or elevation does have an effect on that, and as we'll talk about that more, we'll see the connection really comes down to the connection between temperature and moisture. So what determines these? Okay. So when we talk about biomes, we can talk about, again, I've already mentioned this in the previous slide, you know, why is the equator warmer and the poles colder? Okay, why is the equator wet? Well, other areas, I pointed out 30 degrees latitude, where we have desert areas, why are there areas that are fairly dry? Also, why are there different ranges in temperature? Well, to answer that question, we have to consider the Earth as a whole. Again. These are large areas that are covered by these biomes. And so we're talking about the global connection here to climate and its effects. And so most of you already know that the Earth isn't uh, level, that it's tilted. And so one side, either north or south. Right now we're in <clears throat> April, so we're about in the middle here, not too far off the vernal equinox, the spring equinox, where the sun is darn near directly on the equator. And then we're going to be moving into a time where the sun is going to be more directly on the northern part of the earth. So we're getting into summer, so it's becoming warmer. Days are longer, temperature is rising. And so we can see as we look at the temperatures here, this graph is showing the mean temperature in degrees Celsius. As we go from the equator north and the equator south, okay, this is showing the mean temperature. And you can notice that the temperature, first of all, gets the highest with the lowest amount of variation around the equator. And that's because they're getting the most direct sunlight for most of the year. At each end, at the poles, we have the lowest temperature because even <clears throat> with the tilt of the Earth, we still see <coughs> there is still um, less sunlight that's being captured in that area. And so when we look at these temperatures, you can see the variation that's present there as we move through the different times of the year. There's a connection that I think you should make now. Again, we're talking about moisture and temperature as being the connection here. And that's the connection between altitude, which is how high off the uh, sea level we are, and latitude. Again, the farther north we go, okay, so this would be, uh, let's say, north, and this would be the equator here. So the higher north we go, we could have went south. I just went north because that's my mind. We're in the northern hemisphere here. As we go farther north, we get colder temperatures throughout the year and less moisture. So the amount of growth or the types of organisms that grow in those areas changes as we move up through the different latitudes. Well, the same thing happens as you increase altitude. As we increase altitude, you see a similar type. As we get higher, further away from sea level, the higher altitudes, the air is thinner, less air to hold the heat in. 
so it becomes colder. It's also going to hold less moisture up that way. And so we see a similar trend as far as the biome goes as we move up, as we move increase altitude, I should say, as we increase latitude. Okay? So this is the connection between moisture and temperature as we go through this. Okay? Now there is another interesting effect, again, another look at this where we're looking at the difference increasing latitude okay we're getting less moisture increasing aridity so there are going to be dry areas that are very hot where there's not a lot of plant material there deserts generally are very dry this is also going to show that connection between temperature and moisture now we can see within the ecosystems within the biomes that there are local effects okay one example of that is the rain shower so a rain shadow and so if we look at this we're looking at the western United States so this would be California on this side and then we're getting into Utah Nevada in that region on this side and so these are the Sierra Nevada mountains and so as the rain, which is moving predominantly from the west, comes up, it goes up the mountainside. As it goes up, <coughs> the air is cooled. As the air cools, the water condenses. As the water condenses, it begins to precipitate. So on the west side of the mountain, where the weather is coming from, there's a lot of moisture. It's very lush. If you've ever been to... Um, Northern California, you know that that's a region. There's a lot of trees that grow there, a lot of agriculture that's done in that region. It's a very good region. When we get to the west side of the mountain, as the air begins to move down the other side of the mountain, the moisture has been removed. And so on the eastern side of the mountains, there's not as much moisture, and so there's increased aridity, which leads to deserts. So western Utah... Nevada, a lot of deserts in those areas. This would be a local effect. Okay? This isn't covering a large area. Okay? Now, larger effects on this moisture presence can be seen worldwide by the movement of the air. And so keep in mind, when we talk about heating air, heated air, warm air is lighter than cool air. And so as air is heated, it begins to rise. That's the whole theory behind a hot, water, a hot air balloon. As you heat the air inside the balloon, that air becomes lighter and it picks up the balloon. As the air cools inside there, the balloon will begin to drop. And so what happens is because the most sun is here at about the equator, the the air is rising around the equator, okay? As the air rises around the equator, it's going to then cool and the moisture comes out. So as the moisture comes out, you end up with area right here through the middle around the equator that has a lot of precipitation, okay? So the high precipitation is there, and so that's going to lead to the rainforest areas, a lot of moisture, high heat, a lot of productivity in that region. As the air cools, it begins to move north or south from the equator. Okay, I'm going to focus on the north because, again, we're in the northern hemisphere here. As it moves north, now this air is cooling because it's moved away from the surface of the earth. As it's cooled, it's going to begin to drop, and it happens to come down at about 30 degrees latitude. Okay? We see this both in the north and in the south. And so as it comes down at 30 degrees latitude, the air is dry because all the moisture had come out as it rose. And so as it comes down, we end up with areas that have very low precipitation. Okay? And so think about the southwestern United States. This is an area where there's not a lot of moisture, deserts in that area. If we traveled through, you'd see the Sahara deserts in that area too. 
out across Asia, although cooler because of the altitude, that's also going to be the area where the Gobi Desert is. So we have this ring of deserts that come down where the air comes down. As the air comes down, it begins to move back towards the equator and it begins to move towards the north. And so now it's cooling, it's going to pick up moisture again. So at 60 degrees latitude, give or take, we're about 45. So we are in a temperate uh, forest area. And so we have good moisture, not overabundant moisture, but we have good moisture that's in the air. That's because the air, as it moves along the surface, is warmed and will pick up moisture. And that's why our weathers come from the west, because we have these westerly winds there. And so this gives you an idea of how the movement of air can affect the locations of the biomes across the earth. I'm going to end this video here. In our next video, we're going to continue a little bit on the biomes, making the connection again further between temperature and moisture and productivity of different biomes. Thank you again for watching this video. As always, if you have questions, please post them on the Schoology discussion boards and or contact me with questions. Thank you.